and we are now being recorded. So um, I welcome you all this evening. Thank you so much. This is our third session, our third talk. Um, we've had an amazing response to the other two talks of the first week of COP27, and this is our second week. So we're, we're, we're tonight and we are tomorrow night. Tomorrow night we have actually aviation industry with us. Um, and how aviation needs to change its attitude. So we've got an engineer from aviation and we have also an ex-pilot um, that used to fly out of Gatwick Airport. So that should be an interesting one, but different again tomorrow. Today, I'm delighted to welcome you to this event. It's about air quality, it's about sustainable transport, and it's about the environment. I have some sad news. Um, unfortunately, with all um, those that work at the House of Commons or in the House of Lords, their, their diaries do sometimes clash. And we had one of those this morning. And uh, Baroness Jenny Jones actually can't be with us. And she sends her sincere apologies for that. But we are very, very fortunate to have um, somebody that I think would be extremely interesting I know will be extremely interesting to you all this evening um, it's Zach Polensky he's deputy uh, leader of the Green Party but he is also a member of the London Assembly and he chairs the London Environment Committee um, so he's really appropriate and I am so delighted that he can join us this evening and a huge thank you to to him now I'm going to um, ask Zach to take over from me and the floor is open to him to speak. So it leaves me to welcome um, Zach Polensky um, and ask him to unmute and... Um... Thank you very much, Sally. Uh, very much appreciated and thank you for having me this evening. Um, I'm going to talk for as short a time as possible so we can get into questions because I always prefer um, engagement and dialogue, but there's a few things I'd like to cover. Um, so if you'll bear with me on that. Um, I just want to start, um, I know Sally's already done this, but I feel it's incumbent on me to do it as well, to send Jenny's apologies. Um, she has a public order bill tonight in the House of Lords. This is the bill that uh, covers a lot of things around protesting and being an environmental movement. The power to protest is really important to us to defend. So Jenny would absolutely be here if she could, but sadly can't. Having said that, I can speak with absolute authority on this issue because I'm the London Assembly. I both chair the Environment Committee and I've been doing a lot of work around air pollution as well as aviation. So I'm also very, very happy to be here um, to speak this evening. Um, I think there's a, a few things I want to cover. And actually, I've got some slides that I'm going to share shortly. Uh, these are slides that, that Jenny actually uh, prepared in advance of this meeting. But before that, I was just reflecting on the fact that it's COP27. And actually, a year ago, I was at COP26 as a delegate. And it was an amazing opportunity to be in rooms and be able to speak out both on issues of uh, clean air, but also generally on climate, protecting nature, biodiversity loss. And all of these things are obviously separate issues in terms of they all deserve their own conversations, but they're also inextricably linked. And actually air pollution in particular, I think is one of the best examples where you're talking about environmental justice, but also you're talking about a social justice issue too, because often in cities, the worst air and the most toxic, toxic air often occurs in communities of people of color, or working class communities who often feel like they don't have access to representation to speak out for them. So I think it is always important to put up front that this isn't just an air pollution issue, although that is enough in and of itself, but actually all these things are connected. So I was at COP26 and I was in these various meetings and some of these meetings felt hopeful. Other meetings, I remember being at one at Climate Justice where they paused me halfway through a speech because they wanted to show an advertisement for an insurance company that was selling water solutions in Eastern Africa. And, you know, I complained at the time that, you know, it was not there to be used to sell products. And I think we always have to be careful with that, both around green issues, but also air issues, that we're making sure we're not being greenwashed and everything we do is genuinely making the air cleaner and that we can believe the promises that politicians make and, and more on that shortly. Um, but uh, so I was at COP26 and I was at these various meetings and some of them just felt absolutely hopeless, as in the conversations that are happening in the room felt so disassociated from people's experience, both in Pakistan, where a third of Pakistan is currently underwater. But right here in the UK, too, where we know we have severe issues, particularly around air and uh, air zones around schools and hospitals, where we're not even meeting World Health Organization guidelines around particulates and more on that when we get to the slides. 
But it is important to point out that we were already missing those targets before the World Health Organization, often shortened to WHO, actually tightened those targets. So we were missing them when they were more slack. And we're definitely missing them now that they're more tight. And I'm going to talk this evening, particularly around aviation, but also more specifically around sustainable transport, why it's so important that we take those uh, air pollution targets really, really seriously. But my point about COP26 to finish this story is of all the despair I felt, the time that I felt the most hope was when I left the delegation and left the conference and I was out on the streets where there were communities, particularly uh, young people, indigenous people, people who were mums, dads, grandparents, who were out there who just really cared about these things. And I found myself leaving the conference and actually genuinely having much better and informed conversations out on the streets with community groups, sometimes for an hour or two hours afterwards, where they'd want to hear what had happened in the conference hall and understandably wouldn't want to be fobbed off with, um, oh, there's you know nothing really got done, it was just chatter. They would want specifics and I think people deserve specifics so I would give them. But actually the work that they were doing and in turn the work that you're doing at Cagney is so important because actually that is the stuff that pushes politicians and i know you're not a party politically affiliated organization so you're pushing politicians across the whole board and i think that's really important because actually these issues are more important than one party or one particular political ideology they're issues that need everyone to work together to say this is about the future of our children and our grandchildren but it's not just about the future it's also about what's happening right now both for our health um, in terms of our lungs, but also in terms of our brains and also lots of various um, health conditions that we know are adversely affected by the effects of toxic air. So I basically want to say thank you very much for being on this call tonight. I know people on this call in various guises are either very involved with these causes and doing lots. Some people just pop in, but whatever your level of contribution, the fact that you're making yourself more aware about these things and want to do something about this should not be underestimated because that's actually how political change happens is groups of people coming together and saying, we're not gonna put up with this anymore. We want change and we're gonna lobby for change. And partly what I'm gonna be talking about tonight is a vehicle, I think, and be an eco vehicle at that, um, a vehicle that we can get this change secured. So I'm just going to share my screen, which is not something I do often. So uh, you're going to have to pause for a moment while I just work it out. Uh, brain. Um, ah, got it. OK, so I'm sharing the presentation and I think you should be able to see that. Um, I'm just opening it up from the beginning. There we go. Um, I'm presuming everyone can see that it says clean air, Ella's law is a human right. Brilliant. Ella's law, the clean air human rights bill. So I'm going to get on to more specifically in a moment what Ella's law is. But I just want to begin by taking a step back with why we're doing this. Um, this young lady is Ella Adukissi Deborah. Now, many of you will have heard of her, but if you haven't, Ella, date, um, Ella died aged 19, uh, sorry, nine in 2013 from asthma brought on by air pollution in South London. Now her mother, Rosamond, many of you will know Rosamond Kissy Deborah is a relentless campaigner. She's been amazing at really putting the issue of air pollution on the map, but also continuously campaigning and not taking no for an answer and pushing politicians across all parties and mayors and prime ministers to get change happened. And this started with her daughter, Ella, um, dying because Rosamond was absolutely convinced, and it turned out that she was right, that Ella's death, uh, she had asthma, was caused by the air pollution in London, in Lewisham, that was at a particular uh, high hotspot where that had exacerbated her asthma. And um, when she first initially died, she was told that air pollution couldn't be listed as a cause of death like it had never happened before. And she pushed for that to happen, proved it happened using the science. And she was the first person Ella was the first person to have air pollution listed as a cause of death by a coroner. Now, that is both symbolic, but also an incredibly important moment because it makes tangible that air pollution is a killer and has been killing people. And actually, the effects it has are tragic, just as it was on Ella. But as our next slide says, Ella wasn't the only person killed by breathing toxic air that year or indeed any year. And in fact, the Royal College of Physicians estimates that air pollution causes 40,000 uh, deaths a year in the UK. Now, 40,000 is a huge number. And I know as a politician that often we bandy numbers around and sometimes it is hard to quantify it. But it's worth pointing out, not that there needs to be a kind of hierarchy, any death, whatever the reason, is a tragedy. But when we look at something like COVID and the pandemic, 
with the level of severity that we were dealing with that with and it was right to deal with it that severity it was a pandemic but also um when we see terrorist incidents or any kind of death there is often a media reaction i do think with air pollution that because it's become normalized it's just happened gradually that a lot of the public would just hear that number and not take a moment to think about the fact that that's avoidable it's often baked in i think into our consciousness that people think well, if we want to get around and if we want to move around, then, you know, that's the effect of living in a post-industrialized society. And of course, that is a frame we absolutely need to reject. And I'm sure we will get into that conversation tonight um, about alternatives. So moving on, uh, air pollution. So air pollution is an abstract idea, but actually the thing that is uh, hurting people in terms of their lungs and their health and ultimately causing fatalities is this thing called particulate matter. And we've got here PM10 and PM2.5. The number essentially refers to the size of the particulates in terms of if it was going through a filter, what gets through the filter or not. And I think what's counterintuitive here is that people would often think that something bigger would be more harmful, but actually that fine particulate matter, and we're going to get into why this is so important, particularly for this group in aviation, um, actually is what can seep and penetrate through into our brains. That's how serious these things are. Now, I'm not here tonight to create panic stories or to be doom and gloom, but I am here to talk about or reflect on the severity of what we are breathing in, both through our transport system, through aviation, and also more recently, people have been discussing wood burners, for instance. So there's lots of ways these emitters happen, and we're going to explore some of those here. And it just says here that it increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, bronchitis, and damages children's lung development. And I think it's important to point out there that I think people often know that air pollution is bad for lungs, but things like diabetes and other health term conditions, I think people aren't always aware that actually this has a negative effect across a whole a whole host of conditions. Now, looking at that 2.5, exactly what I just said, uh, these are the ones that can really penetrate things that can cause asthma, damage lung function, promote cancer, and greatly raises the risk of strokes. And according to the Strokes Association, air pollution contributes to 21% of strokes worldwide. So this is not just a, a small thing that can sometimes have an abstract effect. These things really are deadly killers. Now, nitrogen dioxide, which often got called NOx, but NO2 is probably the, the more accessible way to say it. This causes a range of respiratory symptoms, including asthma, stunted lung growth in children, and adverse birth outcomes. Exposure above a certain level significantly increases mortality. And this is what was often coming out of cars, particularly diesel cars, and being pumped into our atmosphere. What's really important to point out here, too, is that sometimes I think uh, a barrier to campaigning has been that people have talked about the effect it has on other people, but we don't often talk about the effect this has on the car drivers themselves and the people in the cars. And actually, if you're in a car and it's pumping out these fumes, you are more at risk from these fumes that you're taking. And then that includes people who are engine idling. So um, nitrogen dioxide, again, is a huge problem. Um, obviously, it's uh, becoming less of a problem with electric cars, although that's creating its own problems because the electric cars can often be heavier. And so on the tyres, the tyre wear also causes particulates. So I don't think they're the technological solution to that either, but more on that later. This is an article from The Guardian that says cancer breakthrough is a wake up call on danger of air pollution. Um, I won't lull on this for too long, but it's just pointing out how in the mainstream media, uh, more and more research is coming out that already demonstrates what we've known for a long time. And in fact, in September, the Francis Crick Institute, which is in King's Cross, presented findings showing how fine articulates awaken dormant mutations in lung cells and tip them into a cancerous state. I'm going to keep moving because I don't want to labor the point too much. I think it's pretty clear, though, that the science is demonstrating what we've known for a long time. And it's always important that we listen to scientists. And again, this is another article with more evidence, including this October, a major study found air pollution particles in lungs, livers and brains of unborn babies. I think it's also important to point out there that the stats show that if a child is born in Kensington, for instance, they are likely to have greater lung capacity than a child growing up in Newham. And that's why I say there's no environmental justice without social, racial and economic justice too. Based on the postcode that you're born in, which often relates to the wealth of your parents and the wealth of your family, uh, will also relate to the quality of air around you. And of course, the correlation between poorer communities and poorer air is very clear. And so that means depending on the wealth of your community and where you're born will depend on the health that you grow up with. That is clearly not an acceptable situation. And that's why I absolutely applaud um, uh, 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 schemes like the ultra low emission zone, 
which without being too party political, but the Green Party proposed in 2016, we were really pleased to see London Mayor Sadiq Khan take on. And of course, that is being expanded. And there's a crucial vote tomorrow for those who don't know um, on expanding it even further uh, to include London altogether. Um, also, air pollution is already known to strongly correlate with miscarriages, premature births, low birth weight, uh, weights, and now thought to likely have many longer term impacts. So I've skipped a slide there. Main sources of urban air pollution are vehicle emissions, heating systems, wood burning stoves, and industrial sources. All of those things, I think, uh, are well settled there. But what we're talking about tonight is this aviation. Uh, we know that aviation, both in terms of the planes themselves, but also the transport to the airports, is a major emitter of air pollution. Now, I'm just going to go off the slides for a second to think about something that Jenny told me um, a few months ago, which was in 2002, she was at a summit on Heathrow, and they talked about how they were going to become the most sustainable airport, and they were going to work on technological solutions to reduce their emissions and not pollute. And I think it's important to say that me and the Green Party, I don't necessarily have any kind of fundamental bias against air travel and aviation. If we can find a technological solution that means that it doesn't cause air pollution, it is not bad for the climate, and it is a sustainable way to travel, then absolutely, let's expand airports, which is not something I ever thought I would say. Let's put some more runways down, let's get people traveling. But until that technolo technolo technology exists, and from everything I can see, it's not even close to existing, then there's a, a precautionary approach principle, which essentially says, do no harm. And right now, for everything we've just said, we know the harm this is causing. So actually, not only do I not think we should be expanding aviation or building more runways, I think we should be reducing aviation. And in fact, my policy would be to do things like close city airport, which I think is totally unnecessary. But on Gatwick, I think the um, onus has to fall on the aviation industry to prove that what they're doing is not damaging to people's health, not damaging to the environment and not damaging to the climate. And of course, we know that they can't do that. So I'm sure there's slides on that coming, but um, I think as soon as we start talking about aviation, it's always important to point out that this is not just being anti-aviation for aviation's sake. This is anti being an aviation industry that is causing so much damage to so many people's lives unnecessarily and shouldn't be allowed to continue. So the fine particulates from airports, uh, from aircraft taking off and landing, road traffic to and from the airport, that's a really important point. It's not just the airplanes themselves, it is all the transport that that's being uh, caused. That's similar actually to incinerators. Uh, there's an incinerator in Edmonton in North London, for instance, where they're looking to expand. People often think when I campaign against that incinerator, I'm just talking about the burning of waste. That obviously is awful for the air, but actually just as bad for the air, if not worse, is for heavy vehicles that are taking that waste to and from the incinerator. So the effects of these big schemes are often as bad as the schemes themselves. And it's important to point out that particles from airport emissions have been found up to 20 kilometers from airports. So this is not just about the immediate area around Gatwick, although that is obviously a huge blight on the people's lives there, but it is on a huge radius from there. I'm also, I know this is slightly different to what tonight's meeting is about, but I imagine you'll be interested. I'm currently committing an investigation on the, in the London Assembly where I chair the Environment Committee into noise pollution as well as air pollution. And there is lots of evidence around airports and aviation and the blight it has on people's lives and day and sometimes night and the awful effects that causes, including psychological effects, but also proven physical effects to people's health from not sleeping, from stress. As I said, tonight is not about noise pollution, but it's always worth saying that this isn't just about air pollution. So Gatwick Airport scores very high. So this is a website called addresspollution.org where anyone can put in, I believe, a London address. In fact, no, sorry, it's national, a national address and find out what the air quality is like in their area. So when creating the slides, we looked at the air around Gatwick Airport, and as you would expect, it is pretty awful. The P PM 2.5 particles, that's the very fine ones, are more than double the World Health Organization's safe limits. The PM10 particles are really high, and the nitrogen dioxide, again, is more than double the World Health Organization's safe limit. And as I said, we were missing that limit beforehand. That limit has now been tightened, so we're missing it even further. And that means we need bold and radical action, both from local authorities, both from the Civil Aviation Authority and from national government. We'll get onto that in a moment. So what would Ella's Law do? Because I've offered all that despair and all that bleakness. So it's time to offer some hope. And I think the big hope before I get into Ella's Law is I feel like five, 10 years ago, I'm sure people on this call and watching this have been campaigning on this for decades and actually couldn't quite work out 
why not everyone cared about this. And I'm still not naive. I don't think everyone cares about this yet. But I do think a significantly uh, bigger amount of people are aware of it and do care, particularly around schools and the health of children. I think there's been increasing awareness of this. We still have a lot of work to do, campaign, advocacy and education work. But I do think it's important to take hope in the fact that we're on the right trajectory here in terms of people are listening to these things, they're understanding and they're wanting to see action from politicians. So Ella's Law is a bill that's being proposed by Jenny Jones in the House of Lords. Jenny Jones is one of the two Green Party peers, along with Natalie Bennett. Uh, Jenny has been tireless in campaigning for Ella's Law, and she was given a private member's bill, uh, which is essentially, as far as I understand it, um, a randomizer of all the peers in the House of Lords, where every so often they get to propose bills that if they clear the House of Lords, then go to the House of Commons and could be law. Uh, she randomly was selected as number one in this um, ballot, which was amazing, and decided to do something on air pollution uh, with Rosamond and with Simon Burkett from uh, from Clean Air. Um, I'm working a long sector across organizations because I think, you know, I started at the beginning by talking about campaigners. We need that coalition of campaigners and civil society to come together. So she's proposing this bill. And the good news is it's looking really positive in the House of Lords. And so then it goes to the House of Commons. The House of Commons is going to be trickier. And I'm going to talk in a moment about how you can help there. But if all goes well, this could be law by February next year. So we're not talking about something where we're kicking this hugely into the long grass. We could have a big change made in February, but of course we've got that big conservative majority, so we're going to talk about that in a moment. So what would Ella's Law do? Well, it would establish the right to breathe clean air as a basic human right. That seems like such an obvious sentence, and I find myself in speeches all the time on media, on TV and radio, and when I go around the country, talking about the human right to breathe clean air. And no one really ever argues with that, but isn't it amazing that it has not been established in law with the strength that it needs to? So primarily, this law would be looking to establish that principle once and for all in statute that breathing clean air is a basic human right and if you're denying people's right to breathe clean air you are in contravention of the law this would require public authorities to bring air quality up to minimum world health organization standards within five years as i said we're already missing targets in london where i scrutinize the london mayor sadiq khan he's missing a lot of the targets in there i'm not saying that to bash Sadiq Khan, because I know we're cross-party as well, but actually me and Sadiq Khan work together on lots of things. In fact, I would say we're a really good example of whether the Green Party and the Labour Party or any two parties can show cooperation and collaboration for the greater good. And Sadiq Khan frequently credits me and my fellow Green Assembly members with coming up with good ideas that he then takes on. But there are gaps in his plan, and I think he's not moving fast enough and with the strength and boldness that this requires. So I think it's always important to point out that it's not about criticising people just for the sake of it. It's about exposing gaps. But it would benefit the mayor, both in London, but any city in the UK, if there was tighter rules that said they had to do these things, because then it wouldn't be a political question. It would be a legal question. This would also require national government to give local authorities the support they need to do this. And it's no secret that often investment is missing um, and councils are cash strapped. So clean air becomes something that becomes less important, which does seem very short sighted to me. And we'll talk about that in a moment, too. But this would require national government to give them the support they need. It would also follow a one air approach that's health and environmental impacts of pollutants and greenhouse gases. It would set limits and targets for each aspect based on the best international standards and scientific advice. Really important to point out there that I massively disagreed with Michael Gove in 2016 that we've had enough of listening to experts. We need to listen to expertise and we need to listen to science, particularly on issues that regard our health. And it would oblige public authorities to take impacts on air quality into account in any planning decision. That one's really important. So if you wanted to expand an airway, um, a aviation uh, centre, you wanted to build a new runway, you would have to prove that you had taken the impact on air quality into account. Not just that, but it would also require the Environment Agency and the Committee on Climate Change to review pollutants and limits annually and advise the Secretary of State if they need tightening while establishing a Citizens Commission for Clean Air, the CCCA, to annually review the Secretary of State's compliance with the law. I said and because there's one more point which I think is the most vital around Gatwick, and that is this. It would amend the Civil Aviation Act to oblige the Civil Aviation Authority. Note the word obliged. This would not be asking them nicely. This would not be about nudging or campaigning. This would make it law. They would have to contribute to the maintenance of clean air in England and Wales and respect for the right to breathe clean air and under Section 1 of the Clean Air Human Rights Act 2022. 
So what that effectively means is if you wanted to expand your runways, you would have to prove that that was not going to have a detrimental effect to the air in your area, which I would say would be nigh on impossible. And in fact, not only that, you would have to look at the amount of flights you already had and look at how you were not going to contribute or not negatively contribute to the maintenance of clean air. So if this bill passes, this presents a whole host of tricky challenges for the aviation industry. And I think that's right that it does because it's about time they answer questions. I should say last month in my noise pollution investigation in the Environment Committee, I invited various um, uh, spokespeople from the aviation industry to come and speak. And they said they were unavailable. They did say they're on holiday. So I'm giving them another chance um, in a month or two. Uh, and I, I'll wait to see whether they will accept the invitation. But this is why these kind of amendments are so important, because it doesn't make it a nice, pleasant request. It can still be pleasant, but it is an obligation. Uh, wouldn't Ella's law cost too much to implement? Sorry, have I missed a slide there? No, I haven't. Uh, no. So cleaner air would mean big changes in our towns and cities, but these are things that urgently need to happen anyway. So just before, because I don't want to just read slides out to you, I think this is a wider question about climate. There's a beautiful comic strip somewhere where a climate scientist is in front of a um, PowerPoint presentation. And they're saying, if we have a Green New Deal and if we tackle the climate emergency, we would have cleaner air, less congestion, uh, more green jobs, homes would be insulated, a greater sense of community, a greater sense of purpose for people around the common cause. And someone puts their hand up in the audience and says, yes, but what if climate change is a hoax? Well, of course, climate change isn't a hoax. But also the point is, these things are worth doing in and of themselves because they make a better society. So cleaning up the air does not mean anyone has to make major sacrifices. It benefits everyone. And that includes someone who regularly drives their car and is stuck in congestion. It's that whole thing of people complaining about traffic. But actually, they are the traffic. So one thing we really need to do reduce the cars on the road. There's a conversation there about how we protect people with accessibility needs, and that's a good conversation to have. We need better public transport, not just better, but it needs to be more frequent. Uh, it needs to be more comfortable. It needs to be more affordable. It can't be right if I talk with my London hat on, that sometimes in London or often it is cheaper to drive your car than to take public transport. That can't be right. And also we need major investment into safer walking and cycling routes. Cycling often gets the attention, not as much attention as I'd like it to get, but actually walking often gets missed. And walking is vital to cities. And there's often that talk of 15 minute cities where everything you need should be available within 15 minutes. You should be able to walk to get there. I would add there too as well on those walking routes to make sure they're green, biodiverse and not good ecological corridors. But that's a talk for another night. A move to more environmentally friendly heating systems in homes and offices and the cost of not acting are very high. Think about the effects that toxic care has on the NHS, the National Health Service. We've just talked about what it does for diabetes, for bronchitis, for lung conditions, for things like COPD or pulmonary fibrosis, the amount of work that Asthma and Lung UK are doing on this. This would massively save money, even if you look at it in cold, hard terms. In fact, the health problems resulting from exposure to air pollution have a high cost to people who suffer from illness and premature death to our health services and to business. In the UK, these costs add up to more than £20 billion every year to the Royal College of Physicians. By the way, I think the health arguments are good enough on themselves, but I think the economic arguments help too. So whatever frame you want to use for this, toxic air is damaging both for our economy, for our health and for the climate. Can Ella's law become a reality? I've covered this, so I'll go quicker here. Yes, it's strongly supported by peers of all parties, Green, Liberal Democrat, Labour, and even some Conservatives. In fact, I went to a meeting recently about the nature and climate um, emergency where I spoke on a panel with Derek Thomas, who's a PE, a P, a MP in the South West, um, who's doing really good work on the environment. And I think it's worth applauding people from parties that you don't agree with on the issues where they're, they're doing good work. It's been... Uh, supported strongly, as you'd expect, by many health and environmental organisations. And I challenged London Mayor Sadiq Khan on this in the Assembly, and he gave me his commitment that he's also supporting Ella's Law, another example of where we work together. So it's looking good in the House of Lords. Now, in the House of Commons, Caroline Lucas, uh, the Green MP, is going to be the sponsor of the, the bill. But we're looking to build up a coalition across all parties. And actually, I'm planning in the London Assembly to try and pass a motion that is looking to call on all of the Assembly to write to London MPs to ask them to back this too. But of course, you don't need the Assembly to do that. Anyone on this call can write to their MP, particularly if they're in London or any MPs in London, if you've got lots of time and your own MP to ask them to back this law. 
just to be clear there, um, because I was coming with a very London centric view, you can write to your own MP wherever you are. And that will um, be a good thing, whether they're in the north, the south, east or the west, just particularly thinking of London because of the, the, the strategic nature of it. How can you help? Just covered this. When the Clean Air Bill moves from the House of Lords to the House of Commons, write to your MP, say you expect them to support it. There's a petition, support the Clean Air Human Rights Bill. You can Google support the Clean Air Human Rights Bill and that will come up. Perhaps someone lovely will pop that into the chat as well if anyone wants to sign it. And also social media. Social media is such, so valuable um, in this mission. I said tomorrow we've got this... Um, a vote in the London Assembly to expand the ultra low emission zone. We've been receiving emails uh, all day about this on both sides, to be fair, and also on social media. But politicians really do take notice of these things. And I think the more noise you can make and the more demonstration that this has grassroots support, the more power that gives to that politician to know when they go in the House of uh, Commons and they sit on those green benches to vote for the future of children and grandchildren, the future of the planet, and also to be standing on the shoulders of giants in terms of the people who have been fighting for this for a long time. And you can see what the air pollution in your area is like on addresspollution.org. Uh, also, on the 5th of 12th to December is the 70th anniversary of the Great Smog that killed circa 12,000 people in 1952. So in 1952, there was this burst of activity around the Great Smog and cleaning up the air, and then that seemed to deplete over after a while. But it did, first of all, lead to the 1956 Clean Air Act, which has been vital. The air pollution now is much less visible, but no less deadly. Of course, that's been a huge problem that the smog went away. So people felt like this had been dealt with. But we know that this is not abstract, that it has real effects. And it's past time for a new Clean Air Act. And finally, I just want to finish with the words of Rosamond, Ella's mum. Ella used to worry they might forget her and move on. She would love to have known that people remember her for something good. So just to say, this is a real moment where Ella's legacy can change the UK can change Europe and change the future of the planet by demonstrating what it looks like when citizens come together and demand better. Um, I said I'd speak uh, for a short amount of time before questions and actually I spoke for half an hour um, <laughs> but hopefully that was all, all good framing for you and um, if anyone's got any questions then uh, I don't know if Sally you want to pose them or if people are going to put up their, their hands I'm happy to work however best to work. Yeah, abs absolutely. Gosh, that was was amazing. Um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think one of the, the biggest problems we have is with Gatwick Airport is that they believe um, the decline in air quality and the particles that come from the airfield is not their issue. And they actually look to government to actually have to deal with this. And I think that's fundamentally wrong um, from an industry. Um, you know, we have Crawley um, Council and, and we have Rygate and Banstead that monitor the air quality, but it's not the 2.5 particles. Um, and so obviously our, our one of our biggest concerns is, is the increase and the prevailing wind that takes these particles towards London. Um, but, you know, it, thank you so much. That was really, really uh, uh, just, yeah so much to take in thank you um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak it's, it's really appreciated and and just to kind of reinforce everything you just said to you you won't be surprised to, to find me agreeing um, <laughs> and i should i'm off, obviously not here to speak for the mayor but uh, the mayor initially supported gatwick expansion but actually when i challenged him on this earlier this year he did confirm uh, he did a u-turn and said that he would also oppose Gatwick expansion. I don't say that to score political points. We applaud people when they come to the right decision. And I'm really pleased to, to see the mayor speaking out on that too. Having having challenged Sadiq Khan in person, I was delighted as well because um, it, it, he, he was so pro-Gatwick expansion. And when we launched Pledge to Fly Less, which is about um, educating um, people about the impact of flying, not demonizing, um, he he just couldn't understand why he couldn't support Gatwick, but he opposed Heathrow. Anyway, I'm going to ask a lady called Jane Bolt um, to ask her question. Jane, are you able to ask your question? Well, I am, if I can remember exactly what I said. That's um, uh, where is it? Okay. Well, I can't find it. But basically, hello, Zach. Hey, uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Basically, I was saying, uh, I was asking if the London Assembly 
would be um, uh, writing against the DCO that will go through next year, not go through, but will be brought um, to the fore next year, if the particles from Gatwick are actually found in London. Thanks, Jane. Or uh, what's that effect? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, um, uh, your question's brilliant, and I think it is important to point out that uh, at any airport, and particularly Gatwick, because of prevailing winds, this doesn't just affect a small area. And I think this is a London issue as well. I'm, I'm here with my national hat on tonight, I guess, as deputy leader, but I think equally as a London assembly member, what goes on at Gatwick is very concerning and also the precedent that sets as well for heat throws, Stansted and, and City Airport. Um, I'm going to give a small caveat, which is a little bit boring, and then I'll directly answer your question, but the caveat's important. So because the London Assembly is elected by proportional representation, it's one of the few bodies in the UK that is, other than the Scottish Parliament and now the Welsh Parliament, it means that we have cross-party commit committees, which, side note, is not what I'm here to talk about tonight, but I think is an excellent way of doing politics, and I think proportional representation means people have to work together. So as chair of the Environment Committee, I can never come just to an idea by myself. I have to convince colleagues from every other party because it's a cross-party committee. We have to kind of compromise on what is almost the commonest de denominator on things before I can go out as chair and speak on that. So that's very frustrating on some issues like um, traffic would be the obvious one. Mm -hmm. I think I wouldn't be misrepresenting them to say the Conservatives are in favour of more traffic or more uh, cars on the road. And as a Green, I very much want to see fewer cars on the road. So as Environment Chair, I can't speak in public on issues around traffic without expressing the fact that I'm not speaking as chair, I'm just speaking as an individual Green Party member. However, um, aviation is actually one of the very few places in the Environment Committee where there is cross-party agreement, and that includes the Conservatives. And they often come from a noise argument, less from an air pollution argument, because I think they don't want to... Um, reinforce my arguments when it comes to traffic if they start speaking against air pollution but they often say that aviation is a blight on residents lives and they talk about concentrated flight paths i'm sure jane from your question you know exactly what that is but in case anyone doesn't on this call concentrated flight path is essentially where you have lots of planes over a large period uh, large area and that's disturbing lots and lots of residents so you get lots and lots of complaints if you're a decision maker so they found this clever stroke very sneaky way of closing down the corridor and stacking planes. So you can get a lot more planes uh, through a corridor. Now, this means that a lot less people are bothered by it, but it means the people's lives underneath those flight paths are absolutely unbearable because they just have this constant traffic going over. And it's a horrible divide and conquer technique that decision makers have been doing. But actually the Conservatives, to their credit, have stood with the Green Party, Labour and Lib Dems on the London Assembly specifically in speaking out against aviation. Anyway, this is a very long caveat, which is essentially saying that as a Green Party Assembly member, I would absolutely be happy to respond to the DCO. And as Environment Chair, I imagine I would be happy to respond to the DCO, but I can't give you that firm commitment because it depends on what the other parties say. But from everything I've seen so far, I would be very surprised if they didn't give me the delegated authority to do that um, because they also agree that aviation uh, is a blight on Londoners' lives. But I, I can't give you a firm commitment because it relies on on colleagues who I, I don't know what, what what they'd say at that time. Thank you, thank you, Jane, for that that question. And and actually, Aidan had very 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 similar question uh, to that. It, it very much, you know, I understand the mayor of of London has previously been in favour of the expansion of Gatwick. If expansion at Gatwick went uh, to a vote at the London Assembly tomorrow, what way do you think he would vote? Um, I think he'd vote against it. And I think the Assembly, I think there would be a majority to vote against it too. Um, I think there's something else interesting here too, which I don't know if it's too off the, the scope of the topic, so I'll only spend a, a minute and then if anyone has any questions. But I proposed to the mayor a frequent flyer levy. Now, this was something in 2016 that my colleague Caroline Russell proposed, and the Assembly kind of laughed at the idea and the mayor was not supportive of at all. It shows the difference that campaigners like yourselves have made in those six years, because when I reproposed it, he didn't laugh at me. He didn't scoff at it. In fact, he set up a meeting between me and his aviation team to have a discussion about a frequent flyer levy. Now, the meeting was really constructive and they were really interested and they mainly wanted to ask me how it would work. For those who don't know, a frequent flyer levy would, there's lots of models of it, but the one I think I would propose is that people are limited to one uh, flight a year if they must. 
and after that it gets a lot more expensive to fly and there should probably be a cap on how many times people people can fly so this reduces the amount of aviation there is which means that people don't need to expand their runways etc um their objection to it and i think it's a reasonable objection for now is that this would need international cooperation that would be a very difficult thing for london to do just on their own because how do you track flights and things like that but what i'm working to do next is to get the mayor to campaign with me to lobby the government at an international level to say well okay let's start looking at frequent flyer levies but i don't want to be naive i don't think that's going to happen next week because international cooperation is notoriously difficult and takes time but i don't think that's a reason not to stop uh, or to stop and i'll absolutely keep pushing to build up towards that international cooperation because it's clear to me we need to reduce the amount of flights that go on internationally not just in london yeah i mean cagney was very much at the, the heart of of when that that initial idea was was launched and I'm, I'm very much supportive of it and well with with government we're we're delighted that we we submitted with our pledge to fly less um that people be informed at time of booking the flight um and so when you book you're told how much emissions you'll be releasing by flying but also um what we wanted was to relate it to something you do in every day so the number of showers you took just to give some scale of idea of of, of how colossal this is because obviously we get lots of um as i'm sure you do um you know, pushbacks that say that, you know, oh, well, I drive my car, is that more environmentally friendly than, than you know, taking a plane? Um, and I, th I think I think one of the problems we have with, with government policy, et cetera, is that Gatwick would be obtaining a second runway by the back door, so making best use of current facilities. And there's so many airports. We see Bristol, we see uh, Luton, we see Stansted. Um, I could go on. Um, who are all looking to use this loophole in government policy um, to make best use um, of the current facilities without actually adding all the emissions up to, to how, you know, nationally, how much that would, would, would actually be adding to our budget. So um, I know Emil, uh, Emil is, is, is dying to ask a question of you, so I'm just going to ask her to unmute and we'll, we'll, we'll bring Emil in can you unmute yeah th thank you sally I, I mean i i zach started by saying he didn't have anything against aviation and he didn't mind having expansion well actually that goes against demand management from the climate change committee number one number two he was also saying that tomorrow there is a vote and ho uh, hopefully the whole of london is going to be under this uh, uh, ultra zone charge uh, what it means for people in Hillingdon is that all business will cease because uh, TfL and the mayor have not put into place public transport which means I live in one of five villages we can't go from one villages to the others uh, unless we walk which is not really possible uh, and it would mean for me that I can't go to my hospice for my cancer treatment because I don't have any way of going there, it's too far, and there is no public transport. So it might work in London, because London is very concentrating. It doesn't work on the outer boroughs, and I think that Zach really would have been welcome for him to actually come and speak to people in Hillingdon to find out how it would impact us if it happens. But in my case... Amel, Amel what's your um, question, darling? What's your question? Well, my, my, my question is that, is that Zach is actually pushing for uh, um, you know, as part of his pollution uh, um, um, discussion to actually push for the, the, the ultra zone to actually go through the whole of London, it doesn't work in the outer, uh, in oh, the okay. outer uh, yeah. because, I, 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 the get, I get your I get your question in the that yeah, I totally agree. It's the same at Gatwick, is that we have rural areas that don't have the public transport. It's fine when you're in like Crawley or say Horsham Central, but when you actually get to the outskirts, these these the the, the public transport just isn't there. And I'm I'm, I'm sure that like, you probably have regions in London that have that issue. Yeah, and um, so thank you, Amel. Um, just to respond to a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, Sally uh, spoke just before Armel spoke, um, and I was really aware of the words behind you in that lovely graphic saying time is ticking. And I think that's really important in this conversation, actually, that even when I was talking about frequent flyer levy and saying the amount of time it was going to take, 
uh, that work needs to happen, but also we don't have time. Uh, time is ticking, and on all of these things, we need to move as quick and efficiently as possible while protecting the most vulnerable people. And that brings me on directly to, to Armel's question, really. Um, so I think the first thing I should clarify, Armel, is, and I apologise if I wasn't clear enough on this, when I said I was fine with aviation at the very beginning, uh, that is not, <laughs> I'm not fine with aviation at all, in any way that it looks or sounds or feels right now. And I wouldn't particularly want to support an aviation industry in the future. It was just merely a rhetorical device in saying that, the problem is is that it is so damaging that I can't conceive of a situation where it wouldn't be that damaging. Now, it might be in the future in 50, 100 years time, they find ways of genuinely going to jet zero or they find genuinely ways of not producing emissions and not producing particulates. And then I'm saying then it's time for another conversation about it. But until we're in that fairy tale land where there's a completely different reality, then I think it is important we oppose aviation. So I apologise if I wasn't clear enough at the beginning. I, I think that's important to point out. Um, on ultra low emission zone, I won't spend too much time on it because I'm aware that we're here to talk about um, aviation, but I do think you you make points that it's important for me to to respond. First of all, I get I get all around London all the time, including the outer boroughs. In fact, I would say more than any other London Assembly members in, in the Green Party, we make a huge point about going out and speaking to Londoners. I think you make points really powerfully that we need much better public transport. And that's why I put that in my presentation, that we need bus routes. We need to make sure that uh, things are connected more around London. And this is, by the way, nationally too. If we look at HS2, you're just connecting Birmingham, Manchester and London. But if you live in Wales, for instance, it means that the interlinks are much worse. So if you take that same principle into London or wherever you are, if you're in an outer region or if you're in somewhere less accessible, money absolutely needs to be spent to make that more accessible. Now, the ultra low emission zone is a blunt instrument and it wouldn't be my first go to. If we'd had a green mare, we'd look at doing something called road user charging. What road user charging would do is charge the person by the emissions of their vehicle, the type of vehicle they drove, the roads that they're on, the time of day they're on. So the amount they're polluting directly relates to the charge that they're given because we think that's a much more specific, targeted way of doing it, whilst making sure that people's privacy concerns are also addressed. And that's an important part, part of that. We've not got road user charging yet. We've pushed the mayor and he's now agreed that he will bring in road user charging in the future. But it sounds like he's only going to start to research that pretty soon if he's not started already. And again, time is ticking. We need to move on that. In the meantime, though, for everything that I said at the beginning, for the particulates that we badly need to clear up, for the hospitals, for places like the hospice that you're visiting, it's really important that we do clean up London's air. So I think we've got to do all of these things in tandem. And you're right, it's not good enough to just take away people's cars without investing in public transport. But you can't you can't just do one and then hope the other one's going to happen because it's not. So you need to do these things in tandem. And actually, I recently went to Ghent. Ghent has the biggest traffic free zone in the whole of Europe. And I spoke to politicians there that cleaned up uh, the air around Ghent and asked them how they did it. And they said that they just had to be bold. They had to be brave. They listened to people, but they had to be signposts and not weather vanes. And actually, when mm -hmm. they first put in uh, clean air zones, the air pollution on the outer boroughs did go up because actually everything that people worry happens happened. People started to divert and go through other places, so it was worse for those areas. Very quickly, though, the air pollution started to come down, and now it is at significantly lower levels than it ever was, and that's because there was the courage and the long-term strategy to get things done. So I'm not rejecting what you're saying to me. I totally understand that there is concerns for people in areas that are more rural and areas where public transport is not good enough. And that's why the government and local authorities need to get on with investing in public transport. But that can't we can't wait for that to happen in order to take measures to clean up our air. We need to do all of these things at the same time. So um, I'm going to ask Jenny Bates to ask her question because it's a really good one, but I think it's better coming from Jenny herself. So Jenny, welcome. And perhaps you could ask Zach your question. Well, actually, it was more of a comment, but um, I was just commenting, I think, from from my experience of the London plan that, you know, the mayor wasn't allowed to take a position on Gatwick. Um, or I think it was Ken who was trying to actually say no expansion in Gatwick and he wasn't allowed to. So, so I, I um, it's interesting that that. That, you know that that Zach, uh, sorry, that um, Sadiq has made that sort of um, U-turn because he definitely did previously say, you know, expansion was fine, but not at Heathrow, and no London mayor or even mayoral candidate has ever been able to be pro 
Heathrow expansion they just couldn't ever afford to and Boris wasn't and you know obviously Ken wouldn't wouldn't have been so um you know we know that they've had to be anti-Heathrow but yeah it's been dodgy that some of them have been pro um Gatwick expansion but I I it was definitely one of the London plan inspectors that that was actually refused to allow um, wording, I think, by Ken to say he was anti Gatwick, but um, that's going back a bit. It was more of a comment, but thank you. Thank you, Jenny. That's really, really helpful. Really um, could I respond to Jenny very quickly? Yeah, no, go, go, um, yeah please do. Uh, I think Jenny's comments are absolutely right. And from what I understand, so when the mayor responded to me, I should say I don't sit on planning committee, and that's a whole kind of world in itself. But when he responded to me, it was in a very informal it wasn't informal sorry it was very formal it was during most question time but he was responding as the mayor of london when you get into the planning process that's a quasi-judicial process and um, so then someone sitting on that they're both the mayor of london but they're also essentially the decision maker or the arbiter if it's been called in and that would be the mechanism in which he wouldn't be able to do what we would want him to do so i think it's a, a slightly different role but you're right jenny to, to point out that differentiation yeah, we've 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 clashed with 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 um, Sadiq a, a few times, um, especially when he he does talks with the Gatwick logo behind him, um, down at the Labour conference. But anyway, uh, hopefully that is all that is all history. I was really interested by your comment about the incinerator. Gatwick Airport has an incinerator, which they use as part of their carbon neutral because it it supposedly heats one of the terminals. Um, and one of the, the key things that we see is, is that the BA say they're going to use London waste to produce uh, greener fuel. I don't know if you have any views on that at all. Yeah, I have very strong views on this. <laughs> um, so I, I think to rewind back a little bit as well, when the mayor was um, supporting Gatwick back in 2015, 2016, yeah. I think he... Sorry. Yeah, he was he was doing it from what I could see from a kind of economic argument that he was saying we needed to encourage industry and tourism, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, you know, that was such a short sighted argument. And I think it demonstrates the difference we've gone as a country, both through the cops, through um, people like David Attenborough making nature programs, through Greta Thunberg, through the Green Party, if I can put us in there, through Greenpeace, through some good Labour politicians too have been speaking out uh, on this. And I think all of those people coming together, plus the amount of community campaigners meant that it was no longer sustainable to make economic arguments when we were destroying the planet and polluting the air. And I think that's, again, another big win that we should all take hold of, because actually it just demonstrates when you can create that public support that it becomes untenable for politicians to hold positions based on um, economic arguments that I don't think stack up anyway, because there's no jobs on a dead planet, as, as we often say. Um, I also should point out that I sit on the economy committee and we've had a tourism strategy made on the economy committee. And I managed to get inserted into the tourism strategy, a line that says, when considering international tourism, you need to hold that in balance with the climate emergency. And that was my way of making sure that any conversations about aviation always happen when we're talking about tourism, because something else the mayor does that I'm concerned about is um, apparently he's flown around the world. This is from a son, so you know, take it with a pinch of salt, but he's flown around the world 14 times if you added up all his, his air miles that he's he's done as mayor. Now, I don't want to be tabloid about it because I think there probably are legitimate reasons for mayors to travel if they're going to meetings that are international summits, although I would rather they take the train. Uh, you know, where they can do, uh, or Zoom, <laughs> just like this. But, you know, 14 times around the world does seem particularly excessive. Um, so onto the conversation on incinerators, I think this links in, because there's this argument made in North London as well, that the North London Waste Authority, that using incinerator is eco, because you're turning the waste into energy. And I think it's just straight up greenwashing. We know that when we look at waste as a much bigger topic, we have reduce, reuse, and recycling. And recycling often got the attention, but actually recycling is partly when something has gone wrong, because actually what we really need to use is reuse and reduce. So reduce in terms of let's all just buy less, let's borrow more. I love the, the green, in the Green Manifesto in London, we had a policy of a repair shop on every high street, um, looking around the circular economy and just creating a culture where people get things fixed rather than just throwing things away. So obviously there is a space for recycling, but actually um, I think it was a journalist who uh, put uh, something in a waste bin on the street 
and put something in a recycling bin and put a GPS tracker on both things. And they both ended up at the same incinerator. So I think there's a whole conversation around recycling too, in terms of uh, what really gets recycled and how does it get recycled? So um, we shouldn't have all of this stuff anyway to be putting in incinerators. There's then a different question that is, if you know, if you have a lot less stuff, could that be burnt? But I think considering the effects that has on air, uh, on our air and the transport and using that, I think that should absolutely be a last resort. And I just worry about how many local authorities are kind of talking up incinerators where I think anyone with a bit of instinct can look at an incinerator, see the plumes of smoke going into the sky and the lorries going towards it and just work out pretty quickly. That's not going to be very good for anyone's environment or any planet. Yeah, no, um, abs absolutely. And um, I think, I suppose one of the frustrations is that the the, the aviation, especially at Gatwick Airport, they can call, call themselves carbon neutral, but ignore the planes taking off and landing um, through through government policy. And I think also um, the other frustrating is thing is that they believe by um, using um, or, or enable you to fill your reusable bottle um, of water um, that you're you're actually doing things but I suppose going back to what you said earlier we should congratulate for the small things but 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 I guess for for our point of view it's the big thing that that is the the, the concern is is the second runway and the growth factor um and and just not at Gatwick but but Cagney's very much about no new runways um until we can actually see true green aviation and and that's not anytime soon and and it's not even on the draw draw boards <laughs> the drawing board of, of aviation or air, air bus or boeing uh, currently um we're running as we've got a I minute can respond so very quickly i know we've only yeah. got a minute left yeah, but, leave it to you well i was just I, I mean when i say that we should you know um take away the, the small things. I'm yeah. kind of trying to be gracious as a, a, a public politician. I think the public should be absolutely indignant that the aviation industry treat us, including myself as the public, with so little respect and um, with little kind of, uh, yeah, respect is actually the word, that they don't think we can see through the fact that an airport saying we don't include aviation in our targets is absolutely ludicrous. I mean, it's just beyond reproach and I think, it's so important that we never stop challenging that mm. and uh, more power to your voices really please do keep writing to your elected representatives keep campaigning because i think we are winning this battle but just to come back to your logo time is ticking and it's not that action isn't happening action is definitely happening but it's not happening with nearly the speed and the effectiveness that we need it to and so we need to keep working on that and i'm sure you will do Thank you ever so. Um, we really appreciate it. It is half past now and um, it's been a, a fantastic talk tonight and we really appreciate you filling for Jenny. Um, and and um, we, we, you know, we thank Jenny anyway because of her agreeing to do this talk was, was just a, a major milestone for us. Um, this is our second year of, of, of running these talks and um, and, and I have to say that it's just getting better and better. And, and Zach, you have really contributed so much tonight and we really, really appreciate the time you've given. And there's lots of nice comments coming in the chat and there's lots of claps going up as well. So um, for me as chair of Cagney, um, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for attending. If you have registered to attend any of our talks, um, at the end of it, you will receive um, a, a, the YouTube link as well as the podcast link um, and it will be at the end and as I say tomorrow we do have aviation speaking um, we have an engineer and we have an ex-pilot talking about how aviation really needs to change its attitude and so that's quite a new subject for us um, in time is ticking um, but um, one we're going to embrace and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow and it will be 7 30 tomorrow um, this was an earlier one uh, today but Zach, thank you. Lovely meeting you via Zoom. Um, and hopefully we can we can stay in touch. Um, For in sure. Future. Okay. Thank you, everyone, and good night.